Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. I'm your host, Jim Root, joined by the rest of the three-man weave crew for Weave Wednesdays. We got Kai McEwen. We got Matt Cox here. Every Wednesday morning, we're dropping a new BBOC episode talking all things betting in the world of college basketball. Today's episode, if you've been with us before, you know what you're getting. We're going live dog of the week. We've got some power games of the week, mid-major games of the week, a trash man pick of the week, a spotlight section at the end on the best February ATH, ATS coaches, gentlemen. Going to shed some light on those, best and worst. I guess uh, we'll slip that in there too. But without further ado, let's get into the outline here. We start with Live Dog of the Week, our favorite section. Last week... Big UAB win, Matthew. I, I know it was hard for you. We didn't get you to commit fully to fading your owls, but Kai and I jumped on the UAB train and they got it done in OT against FAU. I, I, are you sad you did not bet against your owls? Yeah, it was the right play. You could argue we could have gone back to that same well uh, with Wichita. Uh, overtime again, did the owls find themselves? But for the second time this conversation, they won double. They won overtime by double digits. So uh, kind of a weird little conference run here for my owls, Kai. They've oh, they're gear, playing man. with fire, man. They're playing with fire. They better wake up. Wake up for the tourney, man. Wake up. Yeah, I hope they wake up to win the regular season, too, says this backer of FAU American Conference Futures. We'll see on Sunday. They go to uh, South Florida. Uh, we also got Louisville with a very easy cover. Unfortunately, not outright. They lost at the buzzer. They tied it with six seconds left, did not get back on defense, and gave up a uh, a layup to lose the game to Syracuse. Oregon State covered, and my little rogue Rice pick got absolutely drilled by SMU. I, I can't figure out Rice. They are a complete whack-a-mole team for me. Let's get into this week's slate, fellas. I've got two from Wednesday, two from Thursday to discuss with you. One at the high end of the spectrum on Wednesday in terms of quality of game. One at the very low end of the spectrum. Start at the low end. Chicago State, our independent D1 basketball team here in the city of Chicago, they are plus nine on the road at Eastern Kentucky. Kai, we love Chicago State. We think they're mm-hmm. feisty. This is their final D1 game of the year. Wow. They did just get blasted at South Carolina State, so perhaps there's you know nothing there. And again, this is a team in EKU stepping mm-hmm. outside of the conference. Mm-hmm. Not sure why they care, whereas this is like the finale for Chicago State. I think you get a home run Cougars effort here. What do you think? I, I do too. And, and like I, I said somewhere that I, the South Carolina state game was a little bit different. Um, number one, the spread was like right around a pick. Uh, number two, the the South Carolina state's not out of Chicago state's weight class, so to speak. So I, I think it's a bit different dynamic of South Carolina state really wants to win this game. They don't have many wins this season. It's a different mindset versus a team like a power, a power conference team, a Duquesne we saw the other day, or Eastern Kentucky, a team that's dominating its conference right now. That's very good. That clearly is out of Chicago State's class. I think we do get do get a big effort from the Cougars. I'm not going to take them out right, but I I would lean towards them covering for sure in this game. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to do it uh, both. Bit, Matt, are you, are you jumping in on this game, Matthew? Well, yeah, just some disrespect to Indiana Northwest, uh, the true finale for Chicago State. The uh, the odds makers should I, give I us a favor and line that game. game. I said last yeah, D1 they should line game. that game uh, Monday, <laughs> February 19th, folks. Circle your calendars. Yeah, I, Chicago State, I think I'm 0-5 betting on it against this season. I actually faded them uh, or bet on them against the other MEAC team early in the year, Delaware State, and I lost that one. So uh, I'm officially putting them on the shelf for my betting portfolio this year. All right. Well, Matt, can I interest you in Arkansas as a big home nope. dog on Wednesday night against you Tennessee? Sure can. I can't. You sure can. Okay. Uh, Musselman is 38-24 and 24 against the spread in February in his lifetime. I feel like we always see this, that Arkansas is terrible in January and trends back up. Kyle, they've won two of their last three. However, this team might just be bad. I, I do also want to point out their – did you see their tweet after they won this weekend? I did not. Uh, instead of, we got that dog in us, it said, we got oh, that yes. hog in us. And I don't, think that, <laughs> I don't think that's real good phrasing mm. for the Razorbacks there. Um, but maybe they are trending up. The rotation's still really bizarre. Like three of their mm-hmm. starters played under 10 minutes last game. Musselman's mixing and matching. Any chance they can compete with Tennessee here at home at Bud Walton? Yeah, Brazil is still out of the lineup, I believe. Um, I do think there's a chance they compete. Famous last words. Uh, similar to Chicago State, this is a game that I think Arkansas will cover. Um, he said uh, very, very cautiously, but I will not pick them to win outright. I, I love this Tennessee team. We also saw Auburn just blast Arkansas at Arkansas, so it's possible they really still can't step up in in uh, against the SEC elite, Matthew. 
Yeah, that's my concern. I guess the only saving grace is their bigs are playing better. Jalen Graham and uh, Mackay Mitchell have, have sort of at least solidified some stability up front there. But uh, as I was teasing up front, I just I kind of think this team is dead in the water, even though Eric uh, Marshallman or Eric Muscle March, whatever his official nickname is, uh, has a annual tradition of uh, of doing this. So we'll see. Yeah, this one might just not have the gear to to really do that. I know they beat Georgia at home this weekend, but it, I think they were laying three and a half and they only cover or only one by three. So it didn't even cover that one. It, it just might not have that kind of run in them. All right, Thursday, two that I really like and we'll be taking both of. Uh, we'll, we'll clarify the picks at the end of this section. Don't worry. UC Santa Barbara plus eight at UC San Diego and Maine plus seven at Bryant. Matt, I'm going to you first because I know you love the Bryant Bulldogs this year. And they have been really good in conference, um, especially in uh, on the defensive side of the ball, which is not really what we anticipate out of that team. But Maine just beat them 12 days ago. I think they've got a little something to them. Very experienced team in that league, trending back up maybe towards preseason expectations. It, it, which which of these two, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego, or Maine Bryant, are you looking at? I want to say I love UC Santa Barbara, but I can't say I love them because they've just really not been that good. It's basically a team of 1.5 players. Uh, Jay Mitchell has just no help. Like, yeah, Traore has been a beast up front, but his supporting cast is really, really dicey. Um, I've watched a few of their games at the Thunderdome where they have an awesome home crowd and they just lay an egg. Like, teams have just buried them early in, in the uh, in the game. But this one, Jim, they are on the road. Maybe a an odd uh, anti-home court thing, or they're just yeah. like better outside of their home environment. They've, I don't understand that. They've lost that. four straight home games and won four straight away games. I, so I a negative home court advantage there yeah. for the, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, but you know, if that trend is real to start the conference year, I'm going to inclined to think it's going to continue, especially you're at an all time great price here, right? Like, I mean, if, the, if you had told me what this spread would be preseason, Kai, I don't know if there's a more jaw dropping spread yeah. um, than mm-hmm. UC San Diego laying seven or eight, to UC San Barbara. So this is my only official play of the week. I think the the uh, the Gauchos, um, just on the value alone and the fact that UC San Diego may have hit their apex seems like a pretty good bet. Yeah, it's a crazy spread. Uh, I say that knowing full well that I took Santa Barbara in the first matchup between these two and, and UC San Diego. Uh, they won by seven, but they dominated the game. They were up by 24 at one point at, at, at Santa Babs. Doesn't make a lot of sense. This team preseason was supposed to be top three in the conference. I would say at the very least, many thought they'd win the league and they've been bad. Their defense has been horrible. Uh, But I I do think this is a good situation for them. I I will be adding them to the old card here. I love it, Kai. I'm glad we got you talked into it. Yeah. Another little situational factor there. Uh, UC San Diego's last game was overtime at Hawaii. Now they've had a full week off coming back Thursday to Thursday. So it's not like uh, I'm expecting jet lag or anything, but uh, I do think that could have a little bit of an effect uh, mentally just coming all the way back from the island. Matt, we always hunt those spots when teams return yep. in uh, in November from Maui. And I think this th- th- there's a chance there at UC Santa Barbara. Again, preseason line, absolutely ridiculous. And UCSB has been much better on the road in league play. So I'm going to go with them. The other one, Maine and Bryant. Like I said, Maine just won 12 days ago. So I, I actually think there's something there. Bryant's we do think of as erratic because they take a lot of threes, but they're not taking as many this year. And again, the defense has actually been much better, uh, but I'm still going with it. I'm going to ride with Maine. Uh, so fellas, do you have any others on the Wednesday or Thursday that you are, you have circled? Matthew's raising his hand for the listener at home. Matt, go ahead. I'm going to ride the roll humps. Campbell camels, the fighting camels. I should specify Thursday, Jim, they travel to Monmouth. Um, First time that Monmouth, a young-ish team, is seeing that very nuanced offense that uh, Kevin McKeehan runs. And they just struggled with William & Mary last weekend, right? Like kind of a similar team that runs a lot of intricate types of sets, got caught in a low possession, back and forth, dip and tuck game, needed a a, a late couple possessions from Xander Rice to squeak by the Tribe. I think they're caught in a dogfight again. So I think getting, you know, three to one on the money line, you know, two and a half, three to one probably will be that price roughly. Uh, I think the Camels, who have been quietly really solid in the coastal this year um, can, can be a live dog there. Matt, would they be better if it was on Wednesday? You get your camels on hump day. Ah, okay. Ah, right. I'm all right. crossing mm-hmm. off the sheet now. Thank you. That was the good, final point. Good, I didn't good. see. I yep. missed that. Needed it. Needed it. Uh, Kai, any, anything for you that you want to jump in here or just the, the ones we've discussed? Just the ones we discussed, Jim. I'm just riding with Babs. And again, I think Arkansas will get the cover. Uh, lean towards Chicago State getting a cover as well. Okay. I am taking Chicago State both against the spread and outright. 
UC Santa Barbara also both. And you know what? I'll just go spread on Maine. I, I think they're going to hang around with Bryant on Thursday. Matt, you are going UC Santa Barbara and Campbell? Is yeah, right? I'll add Campbell. I'm not going to bring it up and then not add it. That's not fun. Um, yeah, how dare you? Yeah, so I got two. It, 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 a two for special for me. Love it. All right. Let's get into Blowout City, section number two here. Recap of last week, Gonzaga smashed Portland by 32. Unsurprising. Uh, just could not guard in the lane at all. Indiana State smacked Valpo by 40. We were Kai, we were wondering if that was going to be a letdown spot for Indiana State after the, the Drake win. It was not. They nope. they took took care of business pretty easily last week. And Wright State was up 20 at halftime on Detroit, but let them back in the game, only one by seven. So a, a two and one blowout city section last week. Three more this week, starting on Wednesday with UConn coming here to, to Chicago, visiting DePaul, the absolute dregs of power conference society. UConn 23 point favorite here, Matt. UConn won by 29 in Hartford. Their top five nationally in two point percentage offense and defense. That is really hard to do. I just don't see how this one stays remotely close. UConn has has been focused enough to blow out. They just blew out Georgetown on the road. Why can't they do it to DePaul? Yeah, right. And Dan Hurley has no like empathy or, or pity at all. Like I just think he goes in and, and wants to smash teams. And um, you know, for the exception, I think Mississippi Valley State early in the year where they vividly, like explicitly did not try and run it up to an insane amount. I, I think this one gets out of hand pretty quickly. DePaul has issues trying. So if you're if you're gonna maybe not try in this game, you're not gonna cover 23 points or whatever the heck the spread's gonna be. Yeah, if they put an early run on this is DePaul rollover. Um uh, mm-hmm. as this this could be Dan Hurley's last time to blast DePaul before his brother is coaching <laughs> there. Oh, oh yeah, maybe uh, we'll see. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think they're done, man. They're gonna smash them. I I I like UConn there. Higher yeah, shirts, they... DePaul. Come on. Come on. <laughs> No, Do Josh it. Schertz deserves better. I'm telling you. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's true. For Schertz's perspective, don't take yes. the Paul Josh. Yes. Uh, the other one on Wednesday, VMI headed to Furman. These two played early in the year at VMI. Furman won by 40. It was a complete clowning. Uh, VMI has had some troubles recently, and they were missing Brennan Watkins, their leading scorer over the weekend. You take him out. It just gets even more dicey. They're playing super fast in league play, so there's a ton of possessions to potentially run up a blowout here, Kai. Are we continuing to fade the key debts heading on the road to the Paladins? Man, I guess so. I, I, Furman just not looked very good lately for whatever reason. Even though they've gotten healthy, they've still really struggled. They've lost a couple games. They barely beat East Tennessee State, I want to say, the last game. So I'm not super confident in this one. I, I do think the over will hit <laughs> just because VMI overs have been they've been insane lately. Um, yeah, I, I lean towards Furman. I'm not super confident in it, though. Yeah, totals have gone way up in VMI games. They're eight and four since the turn of the new year. Um, the the numbers are getting higher and higher, but Matt, the possession counts are crazy. And again, this was a complete blowout the first time around. I I, I like this one a lot, Matt. Do you? Yeah, it's like uh, you call it a get. I know they just won over the weekend, but it still feels like a, a get right spot for a team that's seven and five, looking to to still kind of get right ish. Um, and this is a really, it's like going to like the local playground and and playing a, you know, a bunch of middle schoolers as a get right type of game. And just no offense to VMI, but that's just sort of what this roster and this team is at this point. It's a truly a, a, a Petri dish experimentation for next year and beyond for Andrew Wilson. So a t- tough spot, but yeah, I think it's a, a bloodbath. Yep. And then for the last one in this blowout city section, going back to the WCC, one of the big bullies, Gonzaga slash St. Mary's taking on one of the meager competitors, St. Mary's at home, laying 17 against Pepperdine. The Gales have been destroying bad West Coast foes. They have not played Pepperdine yet, but they beat Portland and Pacific four times by 45, 42, 41, and 25. Uh, I think they're fully capable of blowing out another team here, Matt, that has shaky shot selection. Uh, You just can't do that against St. Mary's. They will hold you scoreless for 15 minutes, and, and then before you know it, you're down 30. Uh, St. Mary's won by 29 last year. What do you think? Do do the Gales blow out the waves? I do, and this is the first time they're playing this season. If it was like a rematch situation, I actually might give a slight edge to Pepperdine. Like at least they've seen St. Mary's stuff before, and they can, I don't know, adjust or react, and or St. Mary's may take them lighter on the second time. But first time, uh, the Gales still trying to stuff their at-large resume. I think this is a true runaway as well. So another good selection, Jimbo. Uh, yeah, Kai, ironically, having the, the two teams with the longest winning streak in the country tied for it mm-hmm. in this section in Connecticut and St. Mary's. 
I agree. I agree, Jim. I think it's a bloodbath. Gales by a million. Gales hey, by the a million. The Waves are 1-0 in their there. last one, though. Look out. They went over the, the lines over the weekend. Yeah, so. that's sell high. Sell high as they go to play St. <laughs> Mary's in Moraga. No, thank you. All right, that's it for Blowout City. It's time to get to the power games of the week. But before we do, quick word from our sponsor in BetMGM. BBOC is proudly presented by BetMGM. Use bonus code ACTION, A-C-T-I-O-N, when signing up to get up to $158 in bonus bets when you bet $5. For new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, guys, the power game section of the week. It's a little weak this year, uh, this week, excuse me. A little soft, not not the big time showdowns that uh, we typically like to see here. But Matt, there's a huge one for the SEC standings on Wednesday. South Carolina is headed to the jungle, taking on Auburn. This is a 10 point spread per Ken Palm, but I think that really understates how good South Carolina has been, especially with Colin Murray Boyles exploding. He is their uh, stud freshman, had mononucleosis to start the year. Now he just put up 31 over the weekend in a big Gamecocks win. Of course, Auburn's great at home, 8-4 and four against the spread, covering by an average of four a game. Matt, what do you think happens between South Carolina and Auburn on Wednesday? I think it's a closer game, a lower possession game um, than, than the market indicates. I know Kempom has a 65 possession affair, which feels really low for anything involving Auburn, but just look at South Carolina's game so far this year, right? They held Vanderbilt to 55 over the weekend, brought Georgia down to 61, 62 possessions against Ole Miss, who didn't play much faster. Like, Lamont Paris has effectively dictated every game on their terms, and they've won the majority of those games because of that. They're more physical, tougher to slow a team down on the road. It's going to be, I think, for uh, the Gamecocks, but they've just been game all, all year. And the market, as you mentioned, has been slow to keep up to their rating, right? Like they're covering, but not by massive margins where it's like, okay, four games in the value of backing them or riding that wave are gone. Like they have kind of nicely tiptoed up in Ken Palm just slowly enough where there is still a value. If you think this team is like a legit top 30 team. And I don't know, just with the way they've played in certain spots, Kai, I'm kind of sold at this point. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, but they're awesome. Uh, I, I think a lot of it has to do with coaching and, and you're right. They've been, they've been crawling in the SEC this season offensively. That means they're dictating tempo and their defense has been fantastic. And they had not lost a game by more than double digits besides that Alabama blowout. They've really been competitive in a lot of these games. They beat Tennessee on the road, which is impossible. Auburn, different animal at home. Uh, 10 points does seem like a lot for this South Carolina team. I can see Auburn covering it. Um, I would lean towards South Carolina, but this is different than Auburn on the road. They, they've really shown that they step up uh, on their home floor. So a really tough one to pick for me. Um, it's weird. It's going to be weird to see like a 15th ranked South Carolina be a 10 point dog for the, for the folks out there in the, in the ether. But uh, I, I, I lean towards Auburn, I think. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm curious what the number is because I, I sort of think the market will be 10. Yeah. No, South Carolina is maybe a little undervalued there. What we're saying. Um, I say it every time we talk about Auburn home, no team thrives on like the energy of a crowd the way they do like the pressing Katie Johnson is like a different person when he's playing at home versus when he's on the road and doesn't have that like juice to feed off of uh, they, they get shot. Like you block a shot and suddenly they're out in transition. Jalen Williams is thrown down a windmill dunk. That's really tough to deal with. You've got to be able to survive the runs. But as Kai said, South Carolina has been really good on the road, uh, winning at Tennessee. They're only down one at Alabama at halftime, and then the wheels just completely came off in the second half. I think they compete here. I think they keep that one close. Ultimately, Auburn wins, but uh, I trust the uh, the slowdown Gamecocks to keep it close. Next up, in the ACC, Miami, Florida, headed to Clemson. Tigers just had a, had a huge week on the road last week going to North Carolina and Syracuse, getting two wins to maintain a very, very strong NCAA tournament resume. Miami really needs this to stay in the bubble conversation. They are on the outer fringes of it. They've already beaten Clemson once this year, Kai. They won by 13 on January 3rd. Should this have been in the live dog section of the week? Can Miami go to little John and complete the sweep? I don't think so. Um, but I think eight points is a lot to lay for Clemson. Um, they haven't really been 
blowing teams out, out to the point where I think they should be laying this many points, especially to a team in, in Miami who still has talent. They're not playing very well this season, but they're definitely a talented team. Obviously, well coached with Laranega. They've certainly dealt with a ton of injuries uh, this year. I, I, I think, I mean, Keyshawn George is the latest guy to go down for them, but they've had Cleveland in and out of the lineup. They've had uh, Omir was in and out of the lineup. It, it's been a tough season for them. I lean towards them covering eight just because of Clemson not being a, a great large favorite in my eyes, Matthew. Obviously, Little John, tough place to play, but I do think Miami can hang around. Yeah, I mean, they've lost a home to Georgia Tech. They beat Louisville by six. They lost Virginia at home their last three games. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think this spread won't be eight. Again, I don't where I think the Kempom projection mm-hmm. and the market will, will will differ by at least a point or so, uh, as frustrating as that is. But um, I, I actually, yeah, I think the Canes will keep this close. Even if it's like five or something, I, I'm tempted to take the Canes. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. The The home form of Clemson has not been that solid. I mean, their biggest wins are the, at North Carolina, at Alabama early in the season. They won at Pitt. Like they, They've been much more competitive on the road. It's a really old team, a lot of D1 experience on those on the Tigers. Maybe just not built to smash inferior competition, and Miami's not really even that inferior. That's a pretty good Miami team, like these guys said. So I'm, I'm going to lean their way, too. Again, the road dog. Uh, one game of Wednesday, guys, that we don't really have to dive into too in depth. I wanted to mention it though because I think it's a really good spot in the power game circle. Maryland minus three at home against Iowa. I think Maryland's going to be a, a, a very good bet in this one. Iowa's coming off a wild comeback against Minnesota on Super Bowl Sunday. They were down twenty in the second half, came all the way back. Whereas Maryland's actually been trending upwards. They're not quite in the bubble conversation yet, but they're they're trying to make that push down the stretch. Um, I think this is a good Big Ten home team spot. Matt, Kai, any agreement from either of you? Matthias, you're nodding. Yeah, I mean, Big Ten home teams, Jim. Uh, by the way, I was I think I mentioned last show, they had leveled off, I think, in the January segment, but they were, I believe, were five and two over the last week. So I, Big Ten home is just awesome. You know, when in doubt, don't go against it. And I tend to trust Maryland more than Iowa at this stage in the season. Yeah, it's a shame Maryland's so bad. They they did beat Iowa at Iowa. Um, Maryland's defense, man, number one in the conference right now in, in Big Ten play. They're they're only five and eight, but they're the best offense. Uh, excuse me, defensive team, fifth in the country. So at least they have that in uh, kind of stapled down. And it's, of course, it's the exact opposite for Iowa, who's always got an offense bad on D. I do think the spot is really good here for Iowa. They needed a Dawson Garcia injury in a wild comeback to beat Minnesota. So uh, yeah, give me the Terps on on Wednesday. Yeah, just don't expect them to completely outscore Iowa. Maryland is shooting 29.1% from three in league play. They're also shooting that on the season. That's just who they are. They are a poor shooting team, unfortunately. I still like them there, though. I think it's a good spot. Thursday, Colorado is headed to UCLA. Whoa, fellas, the Bruins mentioned in power game of the week. Here they come, man. Mick Cronin has them rolling. They have won seven of their last eight. Dylan Andrews has emerged into a real legit all-conference caliber guy at point guard to go with Sebastian Mack. The international freshmen are coming along a little bit more. Uh, and Stefanovic has been really, really good too. And Kai, Colorado's been awful on the road. One in six against the spread. They had that 47-point blowout at, at Arizona that kind of skews the cover margin, but it, it's not been good when the buffs hit the road. They're laying two per Ken Palm at UCLA. Again, I bet the line is tilted more towards UCLA in their current form. What are your thoughts on this game? Uh, too short. <laughs> I think the spread's too short. I like Colorado here. A uh, little little bounce back from the Arizona loss. Uh, prior to that, you mentioned, yeah, two straight tough losses on the road. Washington State, Utah, really good teams they're playing. The difference is, is, is scheduled the last couple of games here. Colorado's played Arizona, Utah, and Washington State in those four games. You know, UCLA's played Oregon State, Cal, Oregon, Stanford before that USC. Uh, I, I think there's, there's a bit of disparity right now in conference that has UCLA above uh, Colorado schedule. I mean, um, I think Colorado bounces back UCLA competitive, but I, I do. I don't think the, the spread is big enough here. I like the Bruins. I, I hate that. I do, but I do. I just feel like Colorado has been too banged up and bruised all year. And, and Boyle seems to, I don't know, like it should be a really awesome team and they just haven't seen enough consistency with it for me to trust it. And UCLA has just been really good. Like I think the recent efforts are actually better than meets the surface. Keep in mind, Colorado dropped 10 spots in Kim Palm after the Arizona loss. This would not be a two point spread six days. Yeah, ago. that's a good point. It'd yeah, be that's closer valid. to four. Yeah, that, that is a very, very valid point for Mr. McEwen. Uh, also, to your point, Kyle, UCLA has played the 11th toughest schedule 
in the uh, Pac-12 so far, according to Bart Torvik, they have the fourth toughest down the stretch <laughs> remaining. Mm-hmm. So maybe the UCLA renaissance isn't quite going to be what, what we think it is at this point. Uh, I don't have a take on that one. I'm I'm not going to bet that game. I have a hard time figuring out both. All right, to the mid-major game of the week. And these are not mega highlight games, uh, like super big showdowns, but I wanted to at least put a spotlight on a couple teams that are surprisingly in first place in their conferences. One of those is Green Bay. On Wednesday night, they are hosting Northern Kentucky, laying four points per Ken Palm, a big one for Sundance Wicks and the boys here, Matthias. Phoenix have risen from the ashes, et cetera. You got to make that joke when you're talking about them. Last year, they were terrible. Now they are number one in the conference with some brilliant coaching, some big time late plays, a a huge, almost buzzer beating win at Youngstown State over the weekend. Now they got this matchup zone coming to town with Northern Kentucky. Is this a trap for Green Bay? Yeah, Jim, it is their moment to dance in the sun for Mr. Wicks and and Kyle, just continue that terrible pun that you started there. A a good thing with this matchup angle is they already saw the zone once this season, right? They were, uh, I think, befuddled by it uh, in Cincinnati. But now that I get it again, I think we've seen Sundance and how good of a coach he is schematically. Like, I think they'll make adjustments. They can certainly shoot it, right? You got to be able to at least make shots against the zone. I know it's a different type of zone, but um, making shots uh, will be huge here. And obviously, Noah Reynolds uh, coming back from his his illness will be huge, or maybe it doesn't matter because they beat Youngstown State without him. So I don't know. I, I don't understand this team. Makes no sense. <laughs> right. One without No Reynolds, but Sundance Wicks clearly has some magic potions that he sprinkles on a game yep. basis. I don't understand either. Uh, somehow they're twelve and three in the horizon, which is crazy to me. Um, number one in three point percentage and number one in three point percentage defense certainly helps. So they are the ultimate variance team right now. It's all going their way. Uh, Northern Kentucky beat them by 22 in the first game. I, I tend to think NKU is still a better team. So four points is is too much, in my opinion. Uh, I would lean towards NKU. Yeah, this is, this like I said, feels a little trappy to me. Uh, last week, Green Bay won in overtime on the road at Robert Morris, then won on a buzzer beater at Youngstown State. Now you've got this team playing a kind of funky style in NKU that has already destroyed them once. Uh, at worst case, I would I would think this is like one possession game late, like a lot of Green Bay's games have been. So, yeah, give me four with Northern Kentucky. I'll happily take that. They seem to have stabilized without Sam Vincent, their, their key guard who got hurt uh, about a month and a half ago. Next up, Samford hosting Western Carolina. Again, a big nod to Bucky McMillan and Bucky Ball down there at Samford. Hired straight out of high school, Matthew. What a, a bold move by the administration, and he has rewarded them. Second straight season of 20 wins for Samford. They're healthier with Jermaine Marshall back. Of course, Western Kentucky has Vontarius Woolbright, the triple-double machine. Does w- WCU have a chance to hang at Samford, or is this kind of the, the Bulldogs continue to roll? I think they have a chance to hang, but but Samford at home is always terrifying. It feels like some of these spreads that they've been laying against really good SoCon teams seem high, then it's then it's not high enough because that's just they're a different beast down there with that home crowd and the depth and the way they play. It's just a kind of a mini Auburn situation, right? Just the, the way they play the, the juice and the grit, just a tough place to go into and, and handle that pressure. Um, sounds like Justin Gray was really encouraged by their dominating win over Mercer. Um, so maybe the Catamounts can get back some of that ground. They lost with some tough losses early in the SoCon race, but I kind of think Sanford's just a do not bet against this team at home situation. Plain and simple. Yeah, scary team to bet to uh, go against, but eight points is a lot. Uh, I think Western Carolina is a very good team, and and they're top one thirty in Kempom. That that supports that. Plenty of talent, really good ball handling team. Extremely key against Samford, who leads the conference turnover rate. Obviously, tries to wreak havoc with their press. I think Western Carolina and their experienced guards can more or less handle that. Um, the first game was close. They it was a four point game. Uh, uh, Samford ended up beating Western Carolina at their place. I, I lean towards uh, the Catamounts here, Jim. Not confident, but lean their way at eight points. Yeah, I lean their way too. I, Samford, I, man, I I kind of agree perception-wise with that. Like, man, this team's untouchable at home. They press. They've got the crowd behind them. They're seven and five against the spread at home, so not invincible. They just beat Wofford by two. I'll I'll be bold with Kai, and I'll, I'll back that plus eight Western Carolina on the road there. Thursday night, real quick, in mid-major game of the week, Moorhead State. Fellas, this is actually number one versus number two in the standings right now. Moorhead State headed to Little Rock. And Moorhead State's kind of separated themselves. They have the number one offense and defense in league play. That's that's really difficult to do. 
Um, and Jordan Lathan has missed the last two games for them. He's been key, like first team all conference caliber in the OVC. But Matt, they've still got Riley Minix. They've still got uh, Drew Thelwell. They've still got Preston Spradlin on the sidelines. Are they going to go to Little Rock, lay in five, a team with some talented down transfers and yeah. continue to take care of business? No, nah, I kind of like Little Rock here. Tiny Rock, as we used to call them, um, when they lost us gobs of money on an annual basis. But I think we saw Moorhead going on the road to SIUE earlier this year, a team with with pretty good talent too, and, and they looked more mortal. I think you, you see a similar narrative in this game where Little Rock actually has the talent to neutralize Moorhead and the fact that they are at home. I think this game is nip and tuck, and I kind of think Tiny Rock pulls it off. Live dog uh, of the week? <laughs> yeah. Are you going, are you going with that, plus Matthew? Five, I mean... Plus five, plus four, probably. Yeah, I'm I'm going Moorhead here, man. They... This is one of those teams that just dominates their conference year in, year out, and and they're doing it again this year. Nine and three against the spread in conference play, 120 spots higher than the next best team in Kim Pom. 120 in their own conference. I mean, they're dominating. And and Jim mentioned number one offense and defense. It's not even close either end. They're they're significantly better on both ends. So I just think this team's too good uh, relative to their competition. So I, I lean towards Moorhead. And a note for the listener, they, they are doing this without Mark Freeman, who is the reigning OVC player of the year and got hurt in the preseason. Yeah. Like best player, see, ya. okay, we'll continue to be the best team by a cataclysmic margin. OVC's got to figure it out. Now, I mentioned the tra- the transfers on, on Little Rock. They've got KK Robinson, who was originally a top 100 recruit in the SEC. Jameer Chaplin was at South Florida. Mikel Mitchell is twin of the uh, Arkansas big man, has been at power conference schools. So the talent is here. It, it could play up, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stubbornly go with Moorhead too. I just think they're head and shoulders uh, better, especially with the the coaching. Spradlin has just proven to be a star of stars. All right, we move on. Trash man pick of the week. This one was easy, fellas. I I saw this game, knew exactly that it had to be mentioned here. IUPUI is headed to Detroit to dregs of the horizon. Fellas, Ken Palm makes this Detroit minus five. They're 0 and 25 overall, straight up. They have not won a game, and they're going to be <laughs> laying more than a possession in this game. Kai, is this as simple as that's insane? We shouldn't allow that. Let's take the Jaguars. Yes, yes, it is, Jim. And I, I watched this first game too. And let me tell you what, IUPUI was the much better team. <laughs> and I know they didn't have Detroit didn't have Jaden Stone, their best player in that game, uh, but they are horrible. Uh, five. You should not be laying five points against Mississippi Valley State if you're Detroit. So I, I like IUPUI there. Yeah, I do too. I hate that I like the Jags, but it feels like they at least are a partially cohesive team where Detroit's just finding guys, um, you know, on their way to the gym. This, you know, if they have time, they want to come play pickup, you know, come come roll with us. That that just seems like a team I'm not trying to to back right now, even this late in the year. Yeah, it, Detroit's been a little bit feisty. You mentioned they they hung around with Wright State despite um getting down big early, but I think that more had to do with Wright State going to bed than it did with Detroit being some kind of massive competitor. Yeah, I, I just can't lay it with them. It's it's a ridiculous idea that, hey, they, they haven't come out on top on the scoreboard, but you have to win by more than five points now. So, uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with IUPU as well there. I think these guys have figured it out. All right, let's go to our spotlight section, fellas. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the best and worst active coaches in February for Bet Labs. Thank you to Bet Labs for their wonderful data. Um, I, I just kind of perceive this as coaches that are either good or not as good at keeping teams focused through the doldrums of conference sca- schedule. You know, you've got some tough travel probably at this point in the year. If you're doing really well, you could have some sleepy efforts as a favorite, et cetera. Um, so I, I think there's something to this if you're a really good coach uh, at this time of the year. And fellas, we'll start with the best ones from, from UC Davis. Jim Les is 83 and 50 against the spread in February. Not bad at all. Uh, John Dunn of Marist, Matthew, I know a favorite of ours is mm-hmm. 77 and 51. Uh, and then I'll mention Bill Self right here as well. 83 and 61. I know they just struggled on the road at Texas Tech, but I do think that that kind of thing can also help here where if a team was injured or playing below its level earlier, suddenly there's a little bit of value in February. And I think KU might apply there. 
I, I think there's a lot of old school type coaches here that um, you're probably maybe seeing a lot more rematch situations in February in conference play. Some coaches I feel like are really into looking at what happened in the first game where maybe others are just more like focused on fixing their current team at any point in time, you know, internal versus game to game adjustments. I think the ones you've listed here in February seem to be more adaptable, more fungible, probably makes sense why they're better at this point in the year. So I, I am sold on this narrative, Jim, officially. So I guess the, the solution now is to auto bet every UC Davis, Marist, Kansas, Texas A&M, Yale, and Nevada game going forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to expand, yeah, as, as Matt said, Buzz Williams from Texas A&M, 63 and 45. James Jones of Yale, 78 and 59. And Steve Alford, 69 and 52 against the spread. So there's, there's six of them that uh, seem like good bets here. Kai, a couple notables, much smaller sample here, but... Kyle Neptune is 16 and five against the spread. Hmm. I think some of this goes back to Fordham. Some of it goes back to uh, getting Cam Whitmore healthy last year and Justin Moore coming back from the yep. Achilles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like I said, like an undervalued kind of team. Kenny Payne at Louisville is nine and three against the spread in February, guys. So hmm. maybe they just are so bad in non con. There's a little value on them in February. And then Rashawn Burno at Northern Illinois, 15 and six. Are you going to be auto betting Louisville games now with seeing Kenny Bain's track record? No, I think the small sample guys, I, I really think you can um, explain why in, in certain, certain, certain circumstances, excuse me. Uh, in, in Kenny Payne's case, it's what you basically said. They were so bad, so atrocious that they, they got down like 300 in Kempom last year to where there was just no value anymore uh, fading them. And I'm, I'm sure the market was, even going above and beyond on their spreads and, and, and pushing it further than it should have been. So I kind of chalked that more up to that. Uh, you know, the, the other good guys in this list, it makes total sense. And that's right. The guys that can adjust the, the master game planners, uh, obviously very experienced coaches here, and maybe guys that take more of a developmental path to building their teams versus, uh, I suppose, the instant gratification transfer style or, or, or the, the fresh and rebuild sort of thing. Yeah, I think Yale is interesting there, where it's like, obviously, Princeton was the class of the Ivy to start the season, and it was like, oh, man, Yale brought almost everybody back, poor starters, why aren't they the one that looks like a juggernaut? And now here we are in, in February, and they're alone atop the league, one of two undefeateds in conference in the entire country. So, yeah, James Jones knows what he's doing. Flipping it to the other side, there are a couple of surprising names on this list for me. The worst active ATS coaches in February – Leonard Hamilton, Florida State, 59 and 77. Mick Cronin, wow, UCLA, even though they're trending up. He's 55 and 73 uh, in February. Bill Cohen at Northeastern, 56 and 74. Jamie Dixon down at TCU, 56 and 73. And Marvin Menzies at UMKC, 25 and 42. Kind of these names really jump out to you as okay, they belong here, or I understand why. What are your thoughts on that group? No, all five of these kind of surprised me. I think I would bet that Hamilton and Cohen are pretty skewed the last couple seasons. Uh, they, their teams have been really, really bad in the past. They've been a lot better, obviously. Menzies, same thing maybe with UMKC. They had so many injuries last year, but the sample size is kind of big enough to where this would encroach on his. Well, I guess UNLV, his UNLV teams weren't great either. So that, that no. kind of. Oof. Yeah. covers him if you if you extended this to his new mexico state days and just focused on that i'm sure they'd be pretty positive but surprising names here yeah definitely yeah i jim i feel like uh cronin and dixon like super hard hard ass coaches maybe they wear and 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 grind their guys to uh to a point where they just don't really have the same uh juice maybe November, December, January. That's a, a big, big reach of a, a narrative to explain those two. But just those guys popped out. I was like, yeah, I can maybe see, you know, got just the way they play, um, kind of losing a little bit of a steam late in the season. Yeah. And it, again, if they were good early, it sets up for less value yes. in February. And I think Dixon consistently is overachieved early in the season relative to expectations. And again, that starts to lead toward inflated prices in February. And you can find value on the other side. Uh, some small sample guys to mention here. Chris Gerlison at San Francisco is two and nine. His old mentor Todd Golden at Florida is twelve and twenty against the spread. And then Danny Sprinkle, a guy we love, who's been at Montana State and now Utah State, is ten and twenty three against the spread in league play. Uh, excuse me, in February, 
Matt, are, are anything we can make of it. this with the with the data boys out there? I, I do think there's mostly due to the fact that they have been probably undervalued severely preseason, and I think they can they climb quickly or early on in the year, and I think it just sets up for uh, you can only go one way, but down in, in February. Um, you know, also just the fact that they they just teams may adjust when they see them in the rematch, right? You know, so they probably run, uh, you know, more more complex sets and you know we talked about the same rematch angle from above there's probably some counter adjustments from the coaches made against them in league play again that was small sample theater here i'm not gonna overreact those are great 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 coaches the clipboard kyle you agree, agree. Don't, don't overreact okay don't overreact yeah these are good coaches yeah maybe girl sends the opposite case of the guys up top where it's like san francisco pretty inflated by now in the ratings and maybe we disagree with how high they are in Kim Pom, for instance and maybe just falls back down to earth. But yeah, I would not have reacted to this. Yeah. And it's a lot of these teams like last two years for these coaches, like were favorites in league play a lot. Um, and maybe just like, aren't able to blow out league foes the same way in February as they're doing to the non-conference foes in uh, November, December. I think that's definitely true of uh, Danny Sprinkle, like big time favorite in big sky at Montana state and just haven't been able to, uh, see that ATS success continue into February. All right, guys, one yeah, final the, uh, fun fact for you. Wait, oh, real quick, I said the Dons are, uh, they were up to 50 in Kempom and now they're down to 80th um, in the last three weeks. So I think they've kind wow. of like, wherever you think they are in your overall power ranking, it's sort of, they're kind of falling back to where we probably think they are. Yeah, I do believe I, I'm either on this show or our, our regular show, Kai has been adamant to that. Like that team yeah. is not 50th, that, that's overvalued. So uh, pat on the back for Mr. McEwen. Well done. Final fun fact, guys, I, I saw as I was going through some of this, Dan Dockich is 22-30-1 and one against the spread as a coach in all games. It just warmed my heart to see uh, such a villain be a bad ATS coach, Matthew. He was performing below expectations even as a coach, certainly doing so as a uh, pundit. So uh, this this warmed my heart. Yeah, when he was a pundit, I didn't like being reminded that he got the uh, the – you know, he was esteemed pleasure of coaching my alma mater. I, I don't like that association. I feel like we should expunge his name from the record books, but uh, I guess there's <laughs> 53 games there to, uh, to revisit, and they're all of the bad variety, losing variety from a betting perspective. So, yep, that just it's good to know that uh, when, when he's chirping and spouting off about stuff, he'd be like, Yeah, well, you were not good against expectations. You're a bad ATS coach, Dan. All right, yeah, Dan just had to close on that fun note there, Mr. Dockich. That is it. Uh, live dog, power game, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, our spotlight section there on February ATS coaches. Hopefully you gained some good insight out of that. Thank you to bet MGM for sponsoring the episode. We'll be back again on next Wednesday. And of course you will get your BBOC fix for the weekend on Friday with Stucky and crew. So check that out as well. That's it. We'll see you next week. 